I see that. Live on YouTube. Hello, YouTube. Oh, that's working well. All right, it's getting better. It's getting better. That was a little tighter this time. Eric and Lauren Klein, welcome to Friday Night Sip, episode 58, according to my notes. Hans and Caitlin Greasy, Jan Kiefer, Jim Brubaker, Linda Forsyth, Lisa, Lisa Asamont. Hello, Asamont. Lisa is a, uh, Anna, you're going to love Lisa. If you don't know her, you should. Another viticulturist, 22 years, lives right up the road from you. Mark Shalinor, Peter Glick, Scotland Kiefer, Tom Danchik. Uh, we're going to get into it with Anna Keller here. Before we begin, I'm going to ask all of the angels to throw out some angel energy because we have another close colleague and peer of ours and, and dear friend who we had on the episode several weeks back that also had to undergo a surgical procedure. She is in recovery. She is uh, going to be getting some radiation. Everything is fine. But if we could just all send some of that positive anal, anal, ah, angel energy of which we are all known, that would be fantastic. Tonight's episode, hello, Debbie Long and Doug Rutherford. Good to see you both. Tonight's episode features a, a, a longtime Southern Angels favorite uh, because we've had the opportunity to see her in Chicago, had the opportunity to taste with her in uh, this beautiful property that we're going to show you quite a bit about. Learn from her every single time that we communicate, exchange, sit down. Uh, she is without a doubt one of the most tireless workers in this industry promoting not only the region from which she produces this wine, that, but also uh, the passion, agricultural, everything that goes into the process of making great wine. And tonight we've got bubbles. So uh, life is always good when you have bubbles. And I am thrilled, honored, humbled, delighted to introduce to all of you, our friend and host, and I'm sorry, guest tonight, Anna Keller from Keller Estates. Anna, thank you so much. Happy to be here on a Friday afternoon with some sparkling wine. It is uh, sparkling wine on any afternoon is always a good thing. Uh, and sipsters, I hope you have some sparkling in your glass because the 2015 Brut Rosé is essentially one of those wines that you just have to have around. Did I see Jeff and Jane Greasy? Hello, Jeff and Jane. Uh, they're uh, just to give you an idea on a, of, of how dedicated they are to wine and this program. They haven't missed a single episode uh, for 58 episodes and they've missed one, uh, but they had their children there and to be there. So that's still, I think the streak is alive and intact. Uh, big wine fans, we're going to talk about sparkling. We're going to talk about Keller. So let's get into Keller first, because you decided to make a sparkling much later than you actually had your first vintage and your father uh, decided to buy 650 acres of land when you were just, I think, in high school in Mexico City? Correct. And did they tell you, I've got good news and bad news. You're not going to go to college here. I mean, well, how did they break that to you? You know what? We had already, we'd been already in the Bay Area before we moved to, to, to we, we made the move. So I, it wasn't a surprise. This was for many years, the place where I'd come on vacation, the place that I knew for summers, winters, any family time was spent here since the early mid eighties. So oh, great. the big surprise was a little, came a little bit later. Excellent. And so you have, if memory serves, three siblings. I do, three siblings, There's... three kids. Uh, okay. And you are the one that has uh, taken the reins of the winery. How did that come about? Well, you know what? I studied biopharmaceutical chemistry and what I chose was actually, I love medicinal plants and I wanted to work with medicinal plants. And it seemed like that, you know, that was kind of the route that I was going down. Unfortunately, or fortunately for everybody, my dad had already planted the vineyard and he had kept a ton of Chardonnay for himself or for the family and had asked uh, the Rombauer who was at that point buying most of our fruit to turn it into wine. So Rombauer was happily fermenting our wine until, you know, as many winters do, 
it got very cold and we had a stuck fermentation. So, they, so wait, so let me let me back up one second. So you your father Arturo planted the vineyard and you were told refresh us on the story that they weren't certain grapes were going to grow there. Well, you know what, back when they planted the vineyard, this is 1988, Sonoma Coast is not yet an AVA. The best known region in Sonoma County is probably Carneros, the Russian River. But and other than those two, it was considered that the coast was too cool to grow grapes. So when they planted and they looked um, at UC Davis, they went to UC Davis and asked for advice. UC Davis said, you know what, I, we think it's a little too cold to grow Pinot Noir there. Any red varietal will struggle. So why don't you plant Chardonnay? Um, Chardonnay, you know, worst case scenario, you could always make it into a sparkling wine. So it's funny that we come back to this conversation, but for many years we produced Chardonnay, uh, Chardonnay grapes, which we sold. We were very fortunate that to be selling to Rombauer in the early nineties, when Rombauer was, you know, clearly establishing a big trend of what, what was to become the typical California Chardonnay. And right. it, point that my dad kept a ton of fruit and said well can you you know let's make some wine but he thought a ton of fruit was not that much wine and that we'd be able to drink 60 cases in a year <laughs> or have a good time trying so so anyway so I went and you know I was finishing I, I was finishing grad school and he needed somebody to go and make a decision about what to do with that stuck fermentation and so I went up to Napa and I visited Rombauer and it was love at first fermentation. So it had let a, me, let's, let's back up for a second and talk about a stuck fermentation. So you have, where exactly did it get stuck? Because last week we had, or two weeks ago, we had on Nick Goldschmidt and we talked about uh, harvest first fermentation. And then, so did it get stuck in the tank or did it get stuck in barrel? It got stuck, it, it got stuck in, in tank. So it was a primary fermentation. So having the two fermentations, alcohol, you know, sugar to alcohol and malic acid to lactic, you can have, you know, at the end of the day, it's a living organism. And if it's too cold or too warm, it could either not grow or die. And so you've got to be at the right range of temperature with the right, you know, nutrient conditions for the, for the yeast to continue living, growing, and obviously turning what you want from one place to the other, whether it's sugar to alcohol or malic acid to lactic acid. Honestly, so, it's been so long, I can't remember what kind of a fermentation that one was. Well, so when you say it was love at first stuck fermentation, were you excited because not only, because because here you got to use all your biochemistry? Yes. Okay. So that had to be kind of exciting. You walk in, everything is dead still from a fermentation stop process because it's too cold. So it has stopped doing what it's supposed to be doing. And then you get to put your schooling and, and science background to work and say, okay, how do we solve this problem? Get the fermentation unstuck. And the rest, as they say, is history. Correct. <laughs> no problem. Uh, and then, so you were making Chardonnay first started Pinot Noir because you're now one of the preeminent uh, limited production Chardonnay and Pinot producers in, in all of Sonoma. And how was the decision once you started growing Chardonnay, when did you decide that you could also grow Pinot Noir? You know what, that was still a decision my parents made. And they very shortly after when they got their first crop, they said, well, yeah, you know, what goes with Chardonnay? You look at Europe, you look at Burgundy, where there's Chardonnay, there's Pinot Noir. So that was literally, I think, one of the things that happened in the history of California is we have to go back and see what worked in Europe, probably in the early stages of any, you know, of our knowledge, we've mimicked what was in, happening in Europe. With time, we've learned, you know, I think that as everything, the pendulum swings, we learn some things, we imitate, then we come to our own, and then we realize that there's some things we want to go back to and some things that don't make sense, but it, the problem with winemaking is that you only make choices once a year. So your learning curve is not like we can, you know, we don't have software updates every three months. And if we screw up, we don't get a chance to do the 0.2 version. So right. we're sort of learning on a very slow curve. Now that's a great point. And also unlike an enterprise software application where you can iterate and iterate and iterate, the environment with which you're making these decisions is never the same because of mother nature. 
Yes. And, and you're always, you know, whether you've got, that's why it's, you know, one of the things that we try to do is as the years going by, for example, you sit down and you look outside and you make notes because when it comes to doing tasting notes, most likely it, you know, the tasting notes for the wines of the 2021 vintage, we will be making them sometime late 2022. So you may start forgetting how warm or cold May was or when were the showers or some of the decisions that you make as you go about, you know, we're making the wine in the vineyard right now. So we need to go back and make sure that in order to learn and to communicate what we've learned, we need to keep good records. I was just going to ask that. So do you take notes uh, like on a weekly basis and jot things down of how much rain we had on, on May 3rd and those sorts of things? Well, trust me right now, anytime it rains, I, I yeah. do rain dance and I also, um, I don't write it down, but we do, we keep measurements. We keep, uh, we keep a log of, of days, log, you know, so we do, it's something that we do very frequently. Well, and we're going to get to sparkling and you, you talked about Europe and obviously you can't talk sparkling wine in the United States without talking about champagne. And I think it's interesting that we're talking to you, uh, a, a female pioneer in the wine production business, because the, the two most famous uh, ladies of, of champagne are, of course, Madame Clicquot and Lily Bollinger, or Lily is her nickname, Emily Bollinger. And both of them, when you, when you, Go back to, you talk about going back in history and back in time. When you go back to what Madame Clicquot did uh, in the early 1800s with regards to being a widow and, you know, it was frowned upon. Women actually back in France at that point in time couldn't vote, couldn't own land, couldn't have a job and, you know, earn a wage, couldn't be the head of a household, except those rules actually did not apply to widows. So she made the decision that she was going to run Veuve Clicquot. And it was extremely frowned upon. And she was ostracized from a lot of the circles and those sorts of things. But she made a go of it by really strategizing during uh, the French Revolution and putting ships out at night past embargoes and selling wine to Russia. And when the French Revolution ended and Napoleon was exiled, they had kind of their own merchant trade already set up. And they were moving 25, 30,000 bottles a week back in the early 1800s. So you're in, you're in a long line of, of great women from a standpoint of pushing ahead and forging ahead and being uh, persistent. So, so thank you for pursuing a sparkling. I'm happy to do it. I, I don't think I'm bootlegging, bootlegging just yet, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, let's not rule that out, right? <laughs> I never rule anything out. So what was the decision to actually make a sparkling? You know what, the first sparkling we did was in 2003. And really what set us doing sparkling was a perfect vintage. So it wasn't a decision we made conscientiously. It was that it had been a beautiful, cool year. And we had, there's, I, I always call them, I don't know why I call them gentlemen vintages, but I, whenever it's very paced and measured and you have the luxury of making the decisions when you might want to make the decisions because mother nature is just, you know, taking her time. Then, then you, you know, that year we said, you know what, we've got great conditions. The acid is beautiful in the fruit. Let's, you know, let's try it. And the first, actually the first champagne or sparkling we did was a, it was a Blanc de Blanc. It was all Chardonnay. Um, and it was because we felt the conditions were perfect. So when it, you know, when it came along things, you know, we, we started getting into the habit of doing it when the conditions for champagne or sparkling were great. And are you a fan of sparkling? Is the family a fan of sparkling? Do you have any sparkling aha moments? I, I can't keep enough sparkling on hand. It's, it's constantly, um, you know, we, and there, there's always a lot of debate when, when you open the champagne, right? Or the sparkling wine, is it, is it to greet everybody? Is it when you do the toast? And I always find it's a complex thing because when you greet everybody, everybody's have got really nice, clean palates. So it's wonderful to give them a bit of, of, of bubbles. But right. normally the toast comes later in the meal. And you've probably had a little too much, you know, Pinot Noir. <laughs> and so it's always weird, you know, exactly how to come. But I always love starting any celebration with sparkling wine. Well, and it's actually a good introduction to probably we, one of the most famous quotes about champagne in history. And it's... 
uh, Lily Bollinger's quote. And Lily Bollinger is another one of those pioneer women. And for those of you that are Ian Fleming, James Bond fans, uh, Bollinger has been involved in every single Bond film. So, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. No. Um, I apologize. Just some background chatter. The kids across the street. So this is the most famous quote in champagne, as far as I'm concerned, by Lily Bollinger. I drink champagne when I'm happy and when I'm sad. Sometimes I drink it when I'm alone. When I have company, I consider it obligatory. I trifle with it if I'm not hungry and I drink it when I am. Otherwise, I never touch it unless I'm thirsty. <laughs> it's the best line ever. So, and she's another one that, I mean, her husband died in, early in World War I during Germany occupied Champagne and she had to take over Bollinger Champagne House at, at I think the age of 27. So pretty impressive. To this day, both of those two are, I think, the most famous women in Champagne, without a doubt. Uh, Vouv Clicquot acquired, I think, in 2006 by uh, Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy. They now make upwards of 1.5 to 2 million cases of yellow label a year. Uh, Bollinger is still small, limited production, 100,000 cases a year. What is Keller production of sparkling? 250 cases. 250 cases. I'm a big fan of those 250 cases. Uh, I do want to go to our first poll question because at the end of the time when we turn people's cameras on, they can't answer polls. So now you are from the Petaluma Gap uh, where your AVA or where your winery is located. And it's, I think, the newest AVA. And so what most people don't know is how dominant uh, Pinot Noir is or Chardonnay is. So the two dominant grapes in the Petaluma Gap AVA are Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. What percent of the AVA is planted to Pinot Noir? Uh, and Anna, you can't answer yet. I saw that. It's that's clearly host and panelists cannot vote. <laughs> Can I give hints? Maybe. Uh, all right, we're going to give this five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, seven people with 56% are wrong. Three people at 75% are correct. So we're going to rely on the honor system where you can let us know if you're correct in the chat uh, because it's amazing. You've been a pioneer of making certain the Petaluma AVA was initiated. You're, tell us a little bit about all of the things you're doing with the Petaluma Gap AVA. Well, you know what? It's funny. Once we, we got the AVA, it was, it was a very easy AVA to get through because it was so clear that it was a very unique place and that we had a town associated with the region. And the wind patterns were the first time that an AVA was established solely because of wind patterns and not because of growing soil conditions. And so once we, we, we did that, you know, it took us a long time as a region to come to the decision that we should move ahead with the AVA but it came about to be approved pretty fast. However, it got stuck in some bureaucracies that happened early in the Trump administration. But then we sort of, you know, I did realize that it needed to fly. And I, 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 I you'll, you're going to like this. I always say it's like my kid grew up and went to college. And so by the time I got, we got to that point, I decided it was time for me to focus on Keller Estate and let Petaluma Gap fly. And so for a few years, I, I, you know, I've been on the board for almost nine years. I, I thank them for, for everything they gave me the opportunity to do. But now I'm back. I'm, I'm back doing things for the Petaluma Gap because I feel that now that it's a young adult, we can have conversations again. So one right. of the things that we're really hopefully um, doing is we want to, one of our goals is to get it into sommelier certification exams. Because we know if they start asking sommeliers questions about the Petaluma Gap, then sommeliers are going to learn a lot more about the Petaluma Gap, and therefore people are going to be a lot more exposed to the region. No, that's absolutely a, a great, great idea. And it's interesting, you basically let the adolescent go and kind of get through its teenage years, and now you're back with a little bit more of a mature young adult with the Petaluma Gap, so it's more trainable or amenable. I do want to show uh, the Petaluma Gap is interesting because you just mentioned something that I had not heard before, where it's the only AVA 
that is based upon wind and not soil. I mean, that's, in, that's incredible. And uh, Doug Rutherford, you have one that all expenses paid trip to the Petaluma Gap, but there is a second question. So you have to get them both right to be qualified. So um, I do want to, we'll, we'll jump to Google Earth right now, because I, I think it's interesting when you show the Petaluma Gap, people don't recognize just the geologic formation that has, has caused this uh, and, and where it is located. So of course, the wine region to Cellar Angels is, is only Napa and Sonoma. So you have I'll take the roads off of here and the borders and labels. I'll put those back on. You have Napa right here. You've got Sonoma right here. Uh, water plays a big uh, factor in every aspect of the topography, the climates, the microclimates, the elevations. But the Petaluma Gap is right here. So it, it borders part of Sonoma County, I think goes down in the Marin. But what you have here is aptly named the gap between these two mountain ranges or this mountain range right here. So, and, and I'm stealing Anna Slender because she could discuss this in her sleep. But when you see this up close and just the gap there, the wind that comes off the Pacific and comes screaming through here with fog on a daily basis is essentially mother nature's air conditioner. And I have a bunch of pictures to show folks of what this fog looks like. And I, I think it's fascinating because down here, we have Keller Estate and the Southern portion And I think this is a good vantage point on a, to stop and ask, who do we have to know to drive cars on this road? <laughs> what is the story of say that so I, as ahead. you well know but not all of your let me just work on my connection i apparently my internet connection is not as stable um can you hear me well i can hear you perfectly yes okay so as you know my dad is a, a avid car collector and loves old cars and so that road that you see so beautifully drawn there is a little bit of our our little racetrack that's meant to help us figure out how the cars are doing before we take them on the road. So we are res doing restoration on a lot of pre-war, pre-Second World War cars that need a little bit of love and patience before they go out and, you know, meet 101. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would imagine they do need a little patience before they meet 101. I want to show folks just how bucolic this landscape is. We'll, we'll go on to a street level. So here you have the beautiful hillsides of Sonoma right outside the Keller Estate Winery tasting room. And it's by appointment only. So this is not going to be one of those ones, thankfully, where you are six deep at a tasting room and the person's not going to know who you are and you've got some oyster crackers and you're left to fend for yourself. You get buzzed in at the gate right here. You go through the gates up over the hill and you have it's just magical, this type of scenery that's greeting you as you sit and taste. Uh, it, it is very difficult to imagine a more uh, beautiful spot to taste and, and is with amazing people as well. So I'll, I'll show you kind of the tasting salon because we go right up that road. And right in here is where you taste. And there's actually one of the cars can sometimes be on display there, but here you get a much prettier up close look at the track. Uh, there is no driving by consumers, unfortunately, before or after tastings, uh, it's frowned, frowned upon. Uh, but you can see just how beautiful this is, green. And I understand you are, I love it since you're into the agricultural side to begin with, and now you're farming uh, organically, sustainably. There's 300 plus sheep, did I read that correctly? You did. <laughs> it's a lot of sheep. It's a lot of sheep, and, and you know what? It's it's a lot of baying when, when when they all get rowdy. You can hear them, but uh, they do a great job. They not only mow in the vineyards, but they also mow all of our hills. So it helps keep. It, they're also great at fire prevention. How so? Well, they keep the grasses really low. So mm. if ever 
were to have brush fire, we have very little vegetation available. No, that is perfect. Uh, so we talked about the Petaluma Gap and the wind, and I want to show some folks what that looks like from, and here's an actual, uh, you might know this car, this isn't anything to do with wind, but here's where I said that car is on display right outside. Here is some of the tasting tables that you will sit outside, you know, obviously weather permitting, which is about 361 days out of the year it is permitting, because it's just perfect. You also have the, the wind and the fog, I think, is the thing that people don't understand. And, and this is a very common occurrence between the mountain ranges. And it just comes right in. And I, I, I've only been to your property a half dozen or so times. And every single time it's been in the middle of the afternoon, perfect, picture perfect bluebird day. How often are you shrouded in fog? You know what? Most summer days, we start the day covered in clouds. So what happens is that the, the, uh, the fog layer builds, builds up overnight and is actually moving across the Petalunga Gap. So we wake up kind of surrounded by clouds, which is great because the day then starts very slowly. And as uh, that's a great picture. That's probably around 10 a.m. our time. So we start, and, and those are the last clouds that we have on the property that are moving, uh, you know, moving out because of the wind. So we'll start the morning very cloudy and by 11 a.m. it'll be a nice blue sky. Around two o'clock we'll get the wind to start hitting us and it'll start, it'll cool down. Most of the time we can't really have dinner outside. It gets too, you know, too chilly around here, even during summer. So what's happening is we get enough ripeness, but as soon as it gets hot, it starts cooling down, which allows the grapes to continue their maturation, but it doesn't allow them to get too much sugar, which then keeps everything a little bit brighter, flavorful. And it also, one of the things that's really, that we, we continue to learn about the winds is that it helps the grapes retain acidity. Because it gets cold, they don't lose that acid. And you know, coming back to sparkling wine, one of the things that you're looking, when you're looking for a great source of grapes for sparkling wine is you want grapes that have great natural acidity. Um, Olive wine tends to be acid, but even more so sparkling wine. So, and that you attribute to the, the crisp winds and the fact that that temperature does not fluctuate very much because of the winds? Exactly. So, you know, it heats up, then it cools down and that, that small window allows for the flavors to develop, but the fruit tends to, the, the fruit retains the acidity is what we call it. Oh, I like it. Uh, hello, Brett Saunders, Claudia Reed. Thanks for joining. I, I think the, I, I've loved all your portfolio, the, the sparkling, tell me, because you, you mentioned you don't make it every year. So it's not as if you're in that traditional champagne house style where it's like, well, 17 was a bad year, so we're not going to make a 17. You, you make it how and when? Well, you know, when the vintage is great, when we see that we're having a cool year and that we're starting to run low on inventory because as, as a small family produced you know, we keep our, our eye on inventory. And when I kind of see that everything is matching up, we will separate a few tons. And one of the things, just a few tons of grapes, and we'll talk about what grapes we choose later on, but we keep some, some fruit. We actually make our base wine. So we, we start making the base of the sparkling wine at Keller Estate, we ferment it. And once we've created a base wine, then we work with our, our partners at Rack and Riddle and they turn it into sparkling wine. Interesting. And okay, let's talk about the, this wine that we have in our glasses, the Sonoma Coast Bubbles 2015. It is your current release of sparkling? It is, but you guys have absolutely the last cases that we produce because we are about to release our 2018 Brut Rosé in June. And so these were, I, you know, Denise knows people and she was able to twist my arm and get me to, to share them with you guys. Um, so it's wonderful. But and, oh, go ahead. Sparkling wine that because of that acidity, one of the things is not only do, can you age it as you're producing it, but also it ages beautifully in the bottle. So you don't have to worry. Any well-made sparkling wine, you can forget about it in your, in your wine fridge. And when you bring it out, chances are you'll have a beautiful sparkling wine. My dad went to celebrate, I think it was his 60th birthday, and he went to, to Veuve Clicquot, 
and they wanted to bring out a, a sparkling wine from his year, which was 1932. They just didn't have that particular year. You know, they had, damn, they had 1931. So they actually brought out the 1960 because they said, well, 60 is your 60 years. And so that's, I'm always surprised about sparkling wine. And I'm sure you have many stories to say about um, how sparkling wine ages. Well, it, you're right. It, or doesn't age. It, it seems that it can be fantastic 30, 40, 50, 60, 80 years old. And you can read when you're doing research on sparkling wine, uh, they've recently found some Veuve Clicquot in Lake Huron in, in the 90s and early 2000s, a shipwreck. And there was wines there from the 20s that were still in good condition. They just sent wine up to space and brought it back and I mean, it's amazing what sparkling wine can do, and it is just a, a fantastic beverage. What is the blend on this, the 2015? So it is 80% Pinot Noir and 20% Chardonnay. Okay. And what and, we do, go ahead. Give it the nice, you know, the nice, lovely pink hue. We actually allow a, what we call skin contact, and basically we press the juice very gently and, and we let the Pinot Noir sit in its juice for a few hours so that we can extract just a little bit of color from the skins. You know, if you leave it too much, you get something very bright and a little bit too strong. You, you, you've got to measure exactly where you want to be in terms of having a little bit of color, a little bit of that tartness and those tannins that come from the skins, but not too much to make it something that would, you know, feel like you're drinking a sparkling red wine. Right. And Claudia Reed says, hello, Anna. Uh, she and her husband love your place in the winery. So she's saying hello. Uh, I am going to show our last poll question before I open up the cameras if people want to uh, be seen. So earlier I read a quote by Emily slash Lily Bollinger. If we invoke her, when is the only time you shouldn't drink sparkling wine? When stressed, when celebrating, when tired, when hungry, when you're with your in-laws, none of the above. And I know everyone's humming. I'm sure everybody's really debating which the right answer, right? <laughs> this is this was too much of a this was too much of a softball question. Although I thought someone for sure would pick with the in-laws because it depends on, on the relationship with the in-laws. Do you want to share good sparkling with them or not? I don't know. I have to let people make that determination. I, I think everybody understood that if it's a good relationship with the in-laws, you celebrate. And if it's a difficult relationship with the in-laws, you need to be a little tipsy. So <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. That one should have just been a no brainer. In-laws, you're drinking it good or bad. Uh, Denise is going to our chief operating angel in mission control. We'll be opening cameras should people want to be seen to ask Anna a question. And uh, I am going to show a couple pictures. Anna just talked about the fermentation process uh, and disgorgement and those sorts of things. So I want to show a couple uh, items from that. I, I think I do if I can find them. Uh, oh, she also mentioned where people uh, are getting the last remains of the Keller estate. So you have the Keller estate 2015 rosé of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay on the Cellular Angels website. Many folks that have it in their glass tonight are the beneficiaries of the Cellular Angels sip kit. So if you order one of these kits, kits as I know uh, many of you do, you get the next four or five wines for the next four or five consecutive Fridays and you will have the wine available to taste along with someone like Anna. Uh, this is a special sparkling because anytime you can have a good sparkling wine, it's great. But anytime you can have a rosé sparkling wine, it just kicks it up quite a few notches. So that's where everyone is getting it. And there's it's in stock, but there's not that much left. So uh, this is actually a, a delicious bottle of wine. So thank you, Anna, for letting us have your last few <laughs> access. And, and you're right. Denise sometimes drives a hard bargain, uh, which is no, really not that hard at all. So uh Lise Asamont is a 22-year viticulturist, Anna, so you two can talk shop. She is the proprietor of Dot Wine. And Lise, I don't know if you, um, you can wave. Your microphone's not on if you have a question to say hello or. Hello, um, and hi, Anna. It's great to see you on this platform. I think we've met at a few events in the past. I loved your presentation. It was awesome. Oh, thank so, you. And 
the most important thing is my partner in our company learned a tremendous amount about sparkly wine from you and also about the pedal in my gap because um, it was, it was really cool. So thank you so much. It was so informative. No, thank you. I, I hope it was a great way to start the weekend. It's a perfect and, way. And what other way can you start a weekend without bubbles, right? It's the best way, the only way. <laughs> uh, Doug Rutherford gets the dedicated sipster of the week in an automobile driving. Hopefully he's not driving. Hopefully you're in the passenger seat. So, <laughs> Okay, good. Just wanted to make certain you weren't in Europe and you, it's the right-hand side steering wheel. Uh, all good. Uh, all right. So I talked about a couple of pictures as it relates to how we do this crazy thing uh, in sparkling wine production. Here is the riddling aspect. And this is a video, so there may not be audio here, but this gives you an idea of the hand riddling process that was made famous uh, for years. Is that audio on? Of sparkling wine. It's 100% Chardonnay and it's been aging for about a year in our cellar. And the next thing we have to do is riddle it in these authentic oak wine riddling racks that we've imported from France. So what we do is uh, place all the bottles in these customized little holes here, slightly neck down. And then what we're going to do over the next 25 days or so is turn them slightly every day. Now, sometimes we're going clockwise and sometimes we're going counterclockwise. We have a chart that tells us to do that. But to remember where we are on the bottle, uh, we take a pen and make a little mark. And I don't know if you can see it, but I'll give you something a little bit closer. We just take the bottle like this and go like so. And it goes back into the rack at six o'clock to start off with. And so seven days from now, we'll start our actual twisting of the bottles. And for instance, the first one says you're gonna go from six to four o'clock. Just like that, tomorrow it's going to be, or the day after that, it's going to be from four all the way over to seven. Yes, it's a recipe for carpal tunnel. But uh, if you happen to get one of these bottles and you notice on the bottom, there's one of these marks, you can be assured that it's an authentic method champenois way of riddling the wine. So I know they have, and you probably have them, or I know Rack and Riddle probably has them, given the volume of sparkling that they produce, uh, automatic riddling racks. Uh, but for the better part of three centuries, this was all done by hand. Oh. Little background music. Uh, remember, Anna, during the rehearsal when I said if we screw up once, that would be the under. Uh, so now there's been two or three of them already. So for everyone, if you've never seen a really rack, they're actually great artistic pieces to have in your home now uh, from a standpoint of decoration. But if you've ever seen, I encourage you to find some professional riddling people because they take them and they are so fast that you can't even see their hands moving. And that was the way they are trying to do what, Anna, with the yeast and... Well, basically what they're trying to do is the yeast normally. So what happens in sparkling wine is we make the wine at the winery and we do the primary fermentation. Then we bottle that wine. We add a little bit more sugar and, and, and we top it off. And so the yeast continue to want to ferment that, that, that sugar, but there's no place for the, for the oxygen to go. So it literally carbonates the wine. So we're keeping it inside the bottle, but then we want to get rid of all that yeast. So by riddling it and turning it upside down, we actually make it go all the way to the top of the bottle. So the bottle's turned upside down, as you saw in the video. And then the trick is, how do you get it out and put a nice top on it? So what we do is you freeze the top of the bottle where the, where the capsule normally goes. It gets frozen. You, you actually use, you use a normal, oh my God, I lost the word, just a normal cap on it. And right, like a, like a bottle cap. Like a bottle cap. So you, that normally the wine just has a simple bottle cap. You freeze the top, you take off the cap, that little, you know, that portion of the yeast that has been slowly migrated into the top of the bottle gets expelled. 
And then you have to add back wine and sugar, and that is called the dosage. So you can add nothing. You can just add normal wine, or you can add wine with a little bit of sugar or a lot of sugar, depending on the, the house's preference. And that will give you the different degrees of, of, of bruteness, I was going to say, but I don't know what the different, how it's called. But basically, you can have a naturel, which means that you did not return any sugar to the product or various degrees. And I'm going to let Martin take it from here. No, I, I could sit back and listen to this all day long. Uh, I do know that it, it's the sugar rating system, I think, for champagne is weird because you have um, you have Brut, which is the style that this is, and it's less than 12, 12 grams of sugar per liter. But then you have like extra dry and it's sweeter when you think it should be going in the other direction. So and then there's dry. And so there's, there's a whole classification system. And for people that are drinking sec and demi sec, uh, those have upwards of 35 to 50 grams of sugar per bottle. So if you're getting a headache from sparkling wine, chances are you're drinking sec and demi sec because it just is so sweet. But when you said something about when you uh, get rid of the plug that's frozen and you put the dosage back in, and sometimes it could be still wine and sometimes still wine and sugar, is it literally just like a teaspoon of sugar? I mean, I mean, what, what is the sweetness? It's a teaspoon of sugar dissolved in the wine so that it goes back in, in sort of a almost syrupy like, depending on the degree of sugar that you're adding back. In our case, as you well said, we, we, we do this tasting. And one of the things that for better or for worse, I tend to be very consistent with my favorite, with my flavor profiles. So this, the last time we did a, a Brut Rosé was in 2015. And we are just about to release our 2018. And we chose exactly the same amount of sugar, which is 0.9 grams per liter. So if you make a liter of, of that wine, you're gonna add 0.9 grams of it. So it really is kind of just a very normal formula, but it is to just get the volume back up to 750. So it's very small amounts that you're adding back. And um, does any, anybody else hear uh, the theme from Mary Poppins when I say teaspoon of sugar or is that, was that just me? I'm just making certain. I'm sorry. It's just you. We're talking about <laughs> Mary Poppins never got close to wine. So it's a very diverse wine program, Anna. We go from Mary Poppins to sparkling wine. I do want to show that. Bond. This is what that looks like. So there's your, your bottle cap that, that is on every single bottle of sparkling wine. This is how it all starts out. And the nice thing is that we have to Anna's great credit. She actually, do, 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 do. here we have sparkling wine being iced down. You also have, this is just to, what she described is perfectly 100% accurate. They freeze the necks of these things and, and wait for that solid plug to be able, a solid figure of just yeast and, and then they will take the bottle with a bottle cap off, remove the plug so it explodes out. And then here they will top this off with that dosage that you were talking about. Uh, and then put another bottle cap on and let that ferment a little bit longer. And then a cork. So you can see this is a labor intensive process. So one which, of the things that, you know, sparkling wine, most wines we try to produce and bottle within 12 months. That way we have space and barrels and, you know, a brain for the next vintage. But with sparkling wine, you most likely will go over two to three years. So it takes a little bit more time. So we, we made our sparkling in 2018 and we're releasing it in the summer of 12, 2021. So does, like take Cava, take Prosecco, take some of the other sparkling wines that are made in the Method Chapinois or Method, Method Traditional style, will they have more residual sugar added? You know what, I'm not as familiar with the different winemaking, you know, the different sugar levels, but, and it also depends. If the, you, so Cava and, well, Prosecco is done in different styles. On, you know, Method Chapinois is exactly what we've been talking about, but some other producers actually 
do these fermentations in bigger tanks and then they bottle. So it really varies from region to region. And again, it's all traditional methods. So every, every area was doing it in different ways. Um, so I could not speak to those specifics, to be quite honest. I do like my Prosecco with my mimosas, so. <laughs> that is a good pairing, that is a good pairing, absolutely. Speaking of pairing, uh, bubbles are very, very versatile. So what is your can't miss sea salt and vinegar chips with sparkling rosé? That is the, that is the chef de cuisine of champions this evening. Uh, what would be a can't miss with your rosé? Well, you know what? That's why I brought it out because they do say that fat and salt go really well with, with the acid in the sparkling wine. So it, it is actually very chic to have some very nice Pringles with your sparkling. So I would say that if you want to, you know, for those wine snob friends who are not that knowledgeable, just put those two together and you'll certainly keep them um, interested. But I do, you know, I, again, I, the only thing that happens and, um, so I'll, you know, I just turned 50, so bear with me. But now I'm finding that after two glasses of the sparkling, it's a little too much acid for me. So having something nice and rich and fat is great because it's a good balance um, between that extreme acid that we're tasting, especially if it's at the beginning of the meal. I certainly find that it is important to, they've always said, you know, foie gras is a great pairing for sparkling wine too. So salt uh, yeah. fat is great with sparkling. Well, and it's interesting too, because uh, fried chicken has a, a lot of salt on it. Uh, also popcorn is a killer pairing. So if, if you're sitting and it's movie night, uh, and basically let's be honest, the last year and a half, it's been movie night four nights a week uh, as we're sitting at home. So sparkling and champagne is, I'm, I'm sorry, sparkling and popcorn is fantastic. What are we doing as it relates to flavors? What are you getting now that this is six years old and and what do you think of your baby from 2015 well you know what one of the things that i i really love is and it's something that's always i always find very complex to to describe and that's the minerality that we have because minerality you know i always think of it as people always ask me exactly what does it mean and for me it means that it stays on your tongue just a little longer that's how i describe minerality you have that sense of of the flavor that doesn't go anywhere. It just sits on your tongue. And I find that this one has that beautifully. It just has this kind of intense um, kind of fruit center in the, in the tongue. And I love that from the wine. I, I also kind of really love the fact that you have the acid still popping all over, uh, meaning that it's just upfront. For me, when we're doing blends, I find that acid is in different parts. You know, there's very parts of your tongue have different perception for different you know, for salts, sugar, sweet. Acid normally is at the tip of your tongue, but I also, we're always very, you know, we're always looking for the acid all throughout the palate. So a little bit of acid in the front, some nice juicing it in the mid palate and when, and also at the back of, of your palate. So when we're tasting, it's funny because I, you know, some winemakers have great descriptors, but when Julian and I sit down to actually make blends, we're looking for acid all around the mouth and that it just really gives you that nice, full experience as you're enjoying the wine. And I love the way this wine is doing that right now. I, I would agree with that. And I like the way you described acid. Peter, did you have a question? Okay. Uh, you would have bought something had this been an auction. I was a little slow on calling the paddle there. So I apologize on that. Uh, the, I like the way you described the acid because you're right. When you think about it on the tip of your tongue, you normally think of something like a lemon or, or very sh sharp citric acid uh, on, the, on the tip, but this you can feel throughout. And it's not overt, it's, it's, it's very well balanced with the fruit. So it's not like you just feel acid, but it seems to be very well integrated. Well, and you know what, it's funny now as I, as I swished it a little bit more, not very elegantly, but you also get that, that 0.9 grams of sugar that we added really gives the wine breath. And so, um, you know, you don't taste the wine, you don't feel that it's sweet, but it's the, the sugar that we added is doing the trick of really making the mid palate just burst uh, at the center. A little bit, as we all know, right? When you're cooking, you add a little bit of, of lemon and it brightens everything up, but you also add a little bit of tomato, you know, to a tomato sauce, you add a little bit of sugar and it broadens the, it kind of makes the flavors a little bit softer. 
I think that's also part of the role of sugar in winemaking is to make the fruit just stand out a bit more. And I always, as much as I love understanding the wines of Burgundy and the, which is sort of like our, where we learned all of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir making, I'm, I'm very, always very, you know, I, I, we're in California and we need to let the California fruit shine through. And California fruit tends to have a little bit more sweetness. So I'm always trying to make sure that we can showcase that beautiful California sunshine in the wines. Well, and that's got to be hard since it's in the region. It's funny. There's a, a great wine blog out there called Fermentation written by Tom Wark. And Tom actually described this region, the Petaluma Gap, as you're about as close to the razor's edge of being able to grow grapes as possible because the, the conditions are so extreme, the coolness, the wind, the fog. So it's great that you do get that ripeness and, and you're able to let the fruit shine through. It, it, it's a testament to you. Thanks for being so persevering. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they want to uh, ask Anna and, and that you would like to know? She is a biochemist. She's a viticulturist. She is a, could probably uh, change the oil on any one of the cars that are in our houses. Uh, she's a mechanic. She answers a, a plethora of questions. I, I am not a mechanic. I will not change your oil. I will ask my son to change the oil for you. That I'm very happy to do. That's what sons are for. That's exactly right. Uh, I do have, I mean, last week we started a segment called Things You Might Not Know. And so in the minute or, of things we might not know this week, I want to talk about LVMH. So Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy is a gigantic multinational conglomerate that combined probably somewhere around 30 or so years ago, two of the oldest families in France, the Louis Vuitton family and the Moe Hennessy family. Most people know that they actually own Veuve Clicquot. Some people don't know that they own Hennessy. They also own Moe Chandon. They also own Krug. They also own Chateau de Kim. So when you look at what has happened to champagne production in France, Veuve does 1.5 to 2 million bottles of yellow label alone. There's a lot of grapes coming from outside <laughs> the Champagne or all over the Champagne region. It's not that sleepy little house that it once was, uh, but it is a big giant conglomerate. So it's interesting to think as much as I love Krug, I didn't, I did not know until recently that they were part of the LVMH umbrella. So 250 cases is really something that's awe inspiring and, and that's just really impressive. Well, and the other thing that we didn't talk about was the fact that when they're doing a million cases, they're blending from different vintages to make that base wine. So they they sort of have wine from one vintage and the other. So they, you know, I remember back in 2000, the big thing was like, are they going to have enough sparkling wine for, for year 2000? So because of the way they make sparkling, they're able to really ebb and flow with the needs of the market. And I think it, you know, in our case, it's like, well, we do 250 cases of one vintage and we don't have the technology to mix vintage to vintage. So we're really doing when we think, you know, 2018 was also a really cool vintage. We got a little bit, um, I think we started liking our, our sparkling too much. And in 2019, we also made, we made a Blanc de Blanc, which is a hundred percent Chardonnay. And that's going to be a little bit of a different wine, but you know, you have to have fun and, and um, we have fun making sparkling wine. Is the 2018 in bottle? It is in bottle, but it is, we're sort of waiting, we're, we're getting ready to label and it'll be out by September. Or one. How many, how many cases of that did you make? We made a lot. We made almost 400. I, I, I like that. Um, Denise is in the background raising the ceiling. She's so happy. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a lesser known move from someone of our age, but it was very popular 20 or so years ago, I think. Uh, right up there with who let the dogs out. So that's where we come from. The 400 cases, that's awesome. Tell us a little bit about the, the entire portfolio. How many Chardonnay do you have? How many Pinot do you have? So we make two Chardonnays, two Pinot Noirs. Um, we make a Rosé because we love Rosé and who doesn't? And we also make a little bit of Pinot Gris. We only make wines from the fruit that we grow on our property. So for us, or for me, one of the things that's always been very, very important is to make sure that I'm making wines that are distinct, that are, are you know, our trusted consumers know what they like and they're able to choose based on their flavor preferences. I, we don't get the, so 
something people don't realize is we grow our own grapes, we're stuck with ourselves. So if we had a great vintage grape, if we had a terrible vintage, well, we have to figure it out. We don't buy from other vineyards and we don't get our, our different wines by choosing different vineyard sites. We still have to make the wines solely from our property. And I think for me, that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's always a challenge because you have to make sure that the wines are recognizable yet different from each other so that when you taste through our portfolio, they, they kind of tell a story. No, it's, it's a great story. And a uh, question, Brett Saunders asked a fantastic question. Because the Petaluma Gap AVA is driven by wind, do you notice specifically on the Shard and the Pinot, because of those extreme conditions, are the skins thicker as a result of the winds and cool temps? Absolutely. Uh, we didn't even get into that topic. But yes, because as I always kind of say, like good sailors, they're being beaten by the skin from very early on. And so the skin gets thick really early. So grapes, what they basically are, are little, you know, little bags of, of water. The juice is water, acid, and sugar, but all of the flavors are in the skins of the grape. So if the skins are thicker, that means that you're gonna have more tannins, more phenols, more flavor. And so that combination, winemakers are always looking for that ratio between juice and thickness of the skin. The more, the thicker the skins, the more flavors you have. So awesome. I could go on about that, but. No, that's great. Where, how do people come and taste with you? So we are located 45 minutes north of San Francisco. Our town is called Petaluma and we welcome visitors by appointment. You can also enjoy our wines through Cellar Angels, who we absolutely adore, and uh, or online. We do have a web page now. What we're doing, so being a car-driven family, we started a program called Hit the Road, and basically, if you are able to come and visit us, you make an appointment, you book, um, and we've created customized, curated rally routes throughout Northern California. So you can take a route that takes you from the Golden Gate to Keller Estate and back to the Golden Gate. You can do a, a Sonoma County, Napa County route. And basically we're taking you through the most beautiful roads that we have in our region, coming to Keller Estate, tasting some wines, enjoying a few cars, having a nice light lunch. And then we take you back to your hotel, to your house, to your Airbnb. So that's, you know, we, we, we are inviting just like everybody. We're excited to Get ready. I'm so happy. Today was the best day. I vaccinated my 14-year-old. So that was good. That was a good day. And you can tell the 14-year-old to go change the oil. So yeah. He's in the no, I, years. I, I like to hit the road uh, program because there are a lot of car enthusiasts and you include driving gloves, the whole route and everything like that. It's a pretty neat little um marketing program to get people out into the country and off 101 or off 29. Uh, so that's a brilliant idea. We hope everybody will enjoy. And, you know, we also hope to, so where is everybody located nowadays? So what is home for most of you guys? I see Sonoma, uh, Chicago, Colorado, more Chicago, uh, Doug is at uh, the Bulls game or the Minnesota Timberwolves game. It looks like Eric and Lori, uh, I don't know where you are. Jim and Linda are in Colorado. Uh, Nebraska. Oh, wonderful. So a little bit from all over. So, yeah. you know, we, we all, we're all dying to start planning our next vacation. So make sure you, you put Sonoma on your list. Uh, absolutely. And uh, we will see you in July when we are out there. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Sipsters, next week, we've got Michael Trujillo. So Michael, as you have been with us for the last several weeks, we're going on this educational path of grape selection, soil selection, fermentation, picking harvest process. Anna did a deep dive with us on uh, sparkling wine. Michael's going to be talking about barrel selection in winemaking. And if you know anything about Michael, it's going to be exciting because he actually not only was the winemaker at Herb Lamb, he was the winemaker at Sequoia Grove. He has his own label. And it's an interesting story when a person came from Colorado, went on spring break to California, and basically 40 years later, he's still there enjoying spring break making wine. Anna, I am thrilled to spend some time with you and certainly learn a little bit more about this 
fantastic, which of which I'm going to have more Brut Rosé. Uh, I'm thrilled that your 14 year old got vaccinated. So uh, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your Friday with us. And for all the Sipsters out there, thank you for what you do. Thank you for the support and stay healthy, everyone, and be good to one another.